the problems facing New Zealand's primary sector have been mounting at a rapid pace. So I think it's time for open hearts and open minds. To Sarah's country. This is your country, our country. It's not about a nation bound by geographic boundaries. I mean, sure, we are based in paradise, Aotearoa, New Zealand, but Sarah's country is a concept of a home for you to come to, to have an open mind and an open heart about how we can collectively produce the finest food and fibre in the world in relationship with nature. Because let's be honest, she was here first, and we all know what she says goes. I'm your host, Sarah Perriam, and we are growing together a passionate community of curious consumers and equally passionate farmers and growers, which want the matters that matter most delivered to them through our weekday show. And we endeavour to do that. But sadly, tonight, <laughs> it's not that too sad, is our last Thursday night. Over August, we're going to uh, be analysing how we're going to deliver 2.0 of Sarah's Country. Let's say uh, it's going to be three shows a week, all different in nature with our new partners we're so excited to bring into the family. Of course, this is alongside our foundation family of those at Global HQ. We appreciate that farmers have a, to wade through a multitude of information sources every day to find something that serves their individual needs and, of course, consumers equally. So we want to develop the future of this format to be rich in a diet of data, commentary and analysis around what you want, when you want it and how you want it. So as of next week, we're going to be live simply 7 uh, o'clock from Monday to Wednesday. The same show as you've come to know and love, as we will be surveying our audience and our partners to gauge what you want to see more of and, of course, less of. I also have a very demanding media agency, Perian Media, give it a plug, and just requesting a lot of uh, my time with lots of cool projects on the go. Of course, I'm so excited about uh, scaling it back to deliver, you know, a less is more approach, and we have some pretty cool ideas, uh, but we want yours as well. We'll start that next week. We are an inventive bunch, us Kiwis, and media, of course, is no different, so I want to say congratulations to Field Days uh, for the massive undertaking that it was to bring our last largest rural event on the calendar online. I'd love to hear your comments below wherever you are watching uh, or listening to us live. Do you love our national field days uh, and what do you love about them? Did you what did you particularly miss? about the physical event uh, and what did you like about this year's format? I'd love to know uh, because of course uh, we have to go with the times um, and the time right now is the sad situation around COVID-19. However, as we said, innovation um, brings about a new normal. So did you love Field Days? Did you sign in and watch it? Or what are you missing about that you're looking forward to heading back to the traditional physical event next year? I certainly love deals and I do detest shopping. Yeah, I know, for a woman that detests shopping. It comes from my mother. Um, but I do love a good bargain. And I think every single coat I own, I can attribute to a field days. Whether it's Mystery Creek, Waimumu or Kirwi, I can tell you what I paid for it and which field days I bought it from. I always love spending some alone time in the innovation tent. Um, I like it. I like to just go around, take my time, read all the material, you know, in their booths and ask the inventors way too many questions, you know, for their dry throats from talking way too much. But I'm just so inquisitive about the future of farming and where it's going. And of course, the other thing is as well, catching up with the fresh batch of rural catch of the year. Um, and finding out about uh, their off-camera shenanigans throughout the week. They are always a hilarious bunch. The rural event calendar is starting to swing back into life. Sadly, no New Zealand agricultural show or Christchurch show this year, but we do have the Farmlands Ag Fest in November, which I'm most looking forward to heading over to the West Coast. And, of course, uh, a lot of uh, different types of AMP show structures coming about. I know they're going to be very well supported, because people are just crying out to get back together and see each other. And we're so fortunate that we can do that. All across my Instagram of 
you as celebrities is people screaming at each other to wear your goddamn mask. So at least we don't live in that country. We live in Sarah's country, paradise, your country, our country, where, of course, uh, we want to produce the finest food and fiber in uh, relationship with nature. That's what I was trying to say. And we've been talking a lot about this this week on Sarah's Country. Bit of a theme that I just so happened to create because of there was a, a funding announcement of $20 million from the government into a lot of these catchment and wetland groups uh, around the country. The great work that's going on to enhance the biodiversity uh, and local environments and water quality, of course, as well. So tonight is no less. We actually have two guests around that theme. But uh, after 7.20, we are going to be talking more particularly uh, along the theme of innovation. Uh, There is a a goal to reach a $1.5 billion agri-tech sector here in this country. And it's quite rare to see six government departments all come together to create a clear path and strategy around this. Simon Yarrow from uh, Callaghan Innovation is going to join us to discuss how they plan to link strongly with the Taitaiao vision aimed at increasing the primary sector's value over volume. We're going to get a grassroots look, as I said, uh, and talking about riparian planting from one of uh, Southland's uh, landscaping companies specialising in this for farmers. Tammy Wright from Fork and Spade will join us to share what natives work best. Uh, She's got lots of good tips on filtering water, preventing erosion, and of course, uh, as she says, do it once and do it properly. I'd love to get her thoughts on how the industry is going to attract more green jobs into companies like hers. Uh, This week, New Zealand's world-first effort to eradicate the cattle disease Mycoplasma bovis has made significant progress with a milestone of three years since it was first detected. We're going to get an update from Minister from Primary Industries Chief Scientist Dr John Roach and put a few questions to him on where we could be right now should we have not taken the decision to eradicate. But first up. We're going to discuss uh, on this theme of improving our environment on farm, new guidance that has come out from Dairy NZ and NIWA on how to design uh, and construct farm wetlands that are going to be able to reduce nitrogen leaching by somewhat 25 to 50%. All that up next with Dairy NZ Environmental Manager Aslin Wright Stowe to work out how we can boost our on farm environmental mitigation. This is Sarah's Country. One of the first things you learn when you live out here is where to shop and the things you need to live out here. Like electric fencing, or horse feed, or bee suits, shed bench, chuck food. Do you want a couple of these? Or something stylish to wear. Not everyone's got stuff like this. But at Farmlands we do, and then some. So if you need anything to help your farm... Grow, milk, dredge. Rear! Come on in. Because we're out here too. pleased we got into this. Thanks for your help, Dave. It's a good idea, honey. You reckon it'll come out? Cover it and tell compare to leave it 10 minutes, and you'll be fine. Good call, Dave. Good call on getting those security cameras, Dave. You call a new one yet? Yeah, kind of. When you've got decisions to make, we'll be there to help you make the right call. I'd go for those ones, Bob. Yeah, good call. Did you choose these? Oh, you know. For great advice and insurance, talk to FMG. So new guidance on the performance and design of constructed farm wetlands draws on local and international evidence to show how well-planned wetlands can reduce nitrates by 20 to 50 percent. NIWA, supported and co-funded by Dairy NZ, have developed the new guidance and performance estimates, which shows that the wetlands are capable of significantly reducing nitrate and contaminant concentrations. So joining us now from Dairy NZ is Aslan Wright 
Stowe, Environmental Manager, to discuss this further. Welcome to Sarah's Country, Aslan. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah, thank you for having me. Now, let's work through this. There's a lot of projects across the country that Dairy NZ are involved with. But kicking off with this piece of uh, research, it's quite exciting if we can get it right. What does the best practice look like in terms of constructed wetlands versus natural? I guess the, I guess the first thing is knowing where to put these things So, and, and knowing what the issue in a catchment is. So we, we want to target a constructed wetland so to ensure that it's in the right space, in the right location within a catchment. And therefore it's receiving waters, either surface water or subsurface water, that enables treatment that's going to make a difference. Constructed wetlands along with seepage wetlands obviously have huge benefits from a water quality perspective. They also have large benefits from a biodiversity perspective when they're done correctly. So getting the combination of those two things in the right manner, in the right uh, order, um, can result in significant outcomes and significant improvements for water quality in a receiving environment. Where does one farmer or landowner turn to look to how to best construct in what location? Yeah, it's a, there's a, there, you're right, there's a lot of information out there and Dairy NZ, along with a lot of others, are involved in a lot of different projects. So as a starting point, what we're doing here with these constructed wetland guidelines, and I guess a point of difference for these ones, is that we're really focusing on the performance of them. So rather than a, just a, a sort of a, a one size fits all, what we're trying to do here is get some better definitions of how well these things work and, and just how effective they can be. From there, we will develop further guidance and further, further guidelines that are they're really practitioner focused, i.e. Like farmer friendly, uh, and, and enable practitioners to get on the ground and, and put these things in, construct them the right way uh, through the right mechanisms, the right channels, uh, ensure that the right consenting processes are in place, uh, and but then also make sure that they've got the right guidance in terms of just how they should construct, how they should be constructed, and from the from there, uh, give a, a good indication of how well they will perform in that particular landscape. In this sort of output type versus input environment, is there some sort of consistency amongst regional council planning on what is best practice um, or is it really just working with the land that you have to achieve the best outcome? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. And, and what we're trying to achieve here is, is broader consistency such that the landowner gets the right recognition for the effort that they go to for putting these things in. Yeah. So worked through this process. We've worked with regional council and central government, local government, uh, with, with DOC, with a whole range of different stakeholders to try and get a consistent approach such that if you're in Northland or Southland, we can, have, we can be confident in the performance of these constructed wetlands if they're, they're put in, into the landscape, into a particular farm. And we reckon there's a real opportunity to accelerate their uptake and, and, and get more of these things put into the landscape if farmers get that recognition in terms of the performance. And so that that, that nutrient budget, uh, you know, is becoming more and more important as we move into limit setting processes throughout the country. And so if farmers can get that, that recognition is a, it's a bit of a silver lining, you know, it's, it's a carrot in order to, to try and really accelerate the uptake of these things. Mm, absolutely. And there's so many uh, uses for a wetland. It's not simply just filtration, also in terms of erosion control as well. Uh, how is it best to create a planting plan that acts as uh, one thing to all of these elements a wetland can achieve? Yeah, it's about the right the right guidance and the right guidelines and, and, and constructing these things in the right me mechanism and manner. And so, what what these uh, what, what these guidelines do is they they step you through that that process. And so, what we want is we want some deeper zones that collect sediment. And, and so that's your, that's your first one. And then we want some shallow zones that create the right environment to accelerate that those biological processes. The uptake and, the, and, and through that process you, you can reduce the amount of nitrate. And then some deeper zones as well and so that you're getting uh, opportunities for, for, for sunlight, 
uh, to reduce the amount of pathogens. So it's a, it's a matter of, of making sure that you get that, that, I guess, that sequence right such that we can get the, as many benefits as possible from putting in a constructive wetland. Can you talk us through the relationship with NIWA and Dr Chris Tanner? Yeah, so, so Chris Tanner, Dr Chris Tanner um, is one of the, the country's leading experts in constructive wetlands. He's been working on these things for, for 20 years plus. Um, and so this is a, what we've got here is a culmination of, of, a, of a lot of experience uh, and, and a lot of, I guess, individual case studies, both from a New Zealand context and then bringing in some of the, the broader international case studies as well. And so that underpins those performance estimates that have been developed through this. So, so we work closely with the, you know, the, some of the, the countries uh, and, and Chris Turner is, is certainly one of those, one of our experts, both in New Zealand, but also internationally. I'd like to touch on a catchment project very close to home here, where we are in the Selwyn Hines catchment. 50 partner farms are involved to significantly reduce nitrogen losses on farms. Um, can you expand on a sort of case study example such as that project and what's being achieved? Yeah, well, the, the, the Selwyn Hines catchment is a, obviously a catchment um, with some fairly significant uh, reductions required in, in nitrogen losses. And so the, the Selwyn Hines project is a, it's a dairy and Zed led project working across a, a large number of, of uh, farmers, so up to 50 farmers in that catchment, um, to target and prioritise their efforts on farm to reduce nitrogen losses. And so we work with what we describe as partner farms in there. So we've got 50, 50 partner farms. And we work with them on a one-on-one and one-to-many basis. And, and working with these guys, we, we're looking at how do we most efficiently improve the way that we use nitrogen on farm and how do we most efficiently reduce the losses coming off those farms. So collectively aiming towards meeting those um, relatively large nitrogen reduction targets. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us, Dairy NZ uh, Environmental Manager Aslan Wright Stowe. And congratulations on the great momentum that you're achieving there, Aslan, uh, as we sort of round out the end of a theme on Serious Country this week in terms of wetland and riparian planting. As of course, last week the government has announced $20 million uh, across multiple different projects. And uh, we'll continue on this later in the show with Tammy Wright from Fork and Spade. Uh, a landscaping company in Southland who um, are the ones on the front line planting out those riparian planting. But after the break, we are going to be joined by Simon Yarrow from Callaghan Innovation. Of course, more government funding, and this time into the agri-tech sector, which is set to boom to a $1.5 billion industry if we can get this right. All that up next on Sarah's Country. This is Sarah's Country. morning Kiwi farmers wake up to produce higher quality food. Yet every night some Kiwi families are going to sleep hungry. Meet the Need is a charity founded by farmers and it's here to change all that. We're about New Zealand farmers feeding New Zealand families by donating a small part of what we grow when we can. You can help us make sure no one in New Zealand goes to sleep hungry again. Visit meettheneed.org and follow us on social. Did you know that Israel's agri-tech sector is valued at 10 times that of New Zealand? And that is, of course, because of focused government funding, particularly into this area. 
Now, our agri-tech sector here in New Zealand has uh, got a more more horsepower uh, last week thanks to announcements by Minister Damien O'Connor and Economic Development Minister Phil Twyford. Very timely, of course, as we're over the two virtual weeks of our National Field Days. Joining us now to discuss this and uh, the rise of interest in foreign capital to grow our agri-tech companies is Group Manager for Callaghan Innovation. Simon Yarrow. Good evening, Simon. Thanks, Sarah. Nice to be here. I'm sure you've done quite a few of these in the last couple of months, that would be for sure. And it's just one way that we've shown that COVID-19 has uh, been able to reinforce the lift uh, and productivity that we can get in our sector uh, should we see what's right under our noses. You'd be, you'd be pretty stoked with the level of uh, focus from the government and its importance now around agri-tech? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's um, it's been a process. So, you know, we started on the, the ITP, the Industry Transformation Plan. I've got to stop using the jargon. Um, <laughs> probably about a year ago. It's been a it's been a cross government agency effort. Um, so, Callahan Innovation is just one of the partners, um, along with uh, MB, uh, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Ministry of Primary Industries. We love long names in government. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, it's it's been a collective effort. Um, There's been a lot of work that's gone into putting together that plan, and we're really stoked that, you know, the government has chosen to support it in the latest budget. So, yeah, we're really, really pleased. How much of it is about uh, collaboration across all those industries to talk to each other um, as opposed to actually understanding um, pharma uptake of technology and, uh, and you know, we can talk about all of this uh, as much as we want, but if we don't have farmers uptaking or wanting to work with agri-tech development, we're sort of not really going too yep. far. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So, the, yeah, the government collaboration piece is only a part of the story for sure. So um, what we've done is the ITP split into six different work streams, and one of those work streams is called um, commercialisation, and, and Callahan's leading that work stream. And within that context, technology adoption is a key theme and goal for that work stream. Um, and there's really cool opportunities out there. That's, in fact, one of the competitive advantages New Zealand has. Um, you mentioned Israel in your introduction, Sarah, but you know Israel doesn't have an agriculture market like we do. Um, you know they can't walk down the road and, and talk to, you know, major growers and, and farmers like we can. And so that's an advantage that we want to develop more. Uh, and we see some really good partners already out there, like the Rural Innovation Lab, um, which is a, a farmer network based out of the Manawatu, but now with more of a national reach. You know, we're keen to work with them and help, um, you know, give companies the opportunity to, to partner and develop uh, um, their products and services with farmers. So, yeah, that's absolutely critical. And of course, uh, farmers' own data has been on the table, and the interoperability uh, yes. of these, the collaboration of this data. How yeah. far are we through that with your plan as well? Yeah, no, we've just started working on that one. I mean, that, that, it's fair to say that that issue has been tackled a number of times over the last few years. It's it's really challenging, so we don't want to underestimate the challenges involved. There's a lot of complexity. You know, companies uh, own data sets and, and, you know, with good reason, they don't necessarily just want to give it away uh, when they've put in a lot of work and intellectual property into developing that data. Um, there's also different systems and repositories of data and different standards, the way that the data is stored and used. So yeah, it's, a, it's a bit like getting people to talk the same language, if you like. And, and it, it seems a simple task, but um, actually... Putting that all together is not easy. But again, we see some really, really cool things happening. There's a, a group called the Trust Alliance, which has is, is got a bunch of um, farming groups, for example, um, Potatoes New Zealand and Sanford, the fishing company, um, a lot of really cool tech companies and even retailers like Foodstuffs. And, and they're trying to overcome those challenges around you know, tracking uh, food through the supply chain, which is really important in terms of reducing waste and calculating levy fees and, and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, we see some good collaborations and alliances forming in the area, so we're really hopeful that we can, you know, further develop those in, in, in other areas where it's needed as well. The goal is to get the industry to a $1.5 billion uh, sector. How much of that is going to require foreign investment and what is mm-hmm. the appetite to invest here in New Zealand? Yeah, no, that's a really 
key uh, key key area, key question. So you know, New Zealand doesn't have huge capital markets. That's one of our challenges. You know, compared to say the US or Europe or anywhere really, we, we're quite a um, well, we're actually not quite true. We're really strong in the angel, uh, you know, that early stage investment. But once you get into more mature risk capital, to use the jargon, uh, venture capital, for example, it's it's underdeveloped here. So partnering with foreign investment is absolutely critical. And we've seen some really good uh, investments happening in the space. There's a group called Finisterre Partners out of the US, the biggest agri-tech investor um, in the US. And they've invested in a number of really cool companies here in New Zealand, like um, uh, Biolumic, for example, which does uh, UV indoor um, technology um, and a bunch of others. So, you know, working with those uh, international investors is really important and not just for the money, but also to, to give you that access into those international markets. How, so, how do yeah, we sorry. capture that value back here at home? Mm, mm. Yeah, it's, it's really it's really interesting. So. Um, we do it by making this the best place to do, uh, you know, your research and your development and by making sure we've got the really strong talent here. Because if you do that, then the head office will always remain here. I mean, sure, you, you'll open up uh, offices overseas and we need to because you need that, that sales and distribution. You can't just trade from New Zealand, right? But we've got some good examples of that, um, you know, companies like Robotics Plus, uh, another company called Abacus Bio, which is it's got an office in the UK, but it's it's still very much a New Zealand company doing its research and its development here. So, so creating that right environment for that is really really important. Um, we, sorry, sideline, but uh, it just I was just thinking about the the dire situation around uh, the wool industry and the strong strong mm-hmm. wool sector, and farmers not investing in their own industry mm-hmm. right from the start. There's a lot of farmers who would love to invest in these types of startups mm-hmm. from the start, especially mm-hmm. when they're used as test farms, mm-hmm. test cases, or their data. Yep. Have we got an ability to set that type of market up? Yeah, we do. Um... And, and that's a really, really, and we're seeing that already, right? So there are some investment um, groups that you know that are farmer led, um, and we've seen some really good technology companies um, start out uh, from farmer founders. So probably one of the best examples is BBC Technology, which is a, a fruit sorting uh, automation company. They also happened to be the biggest blueberry farmer in New Zealand. And, and what happened was they saw the problem, right? They, they were like, well, how do I sort my blueberries? No one has a, an automated solution here, and it's really difficult. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we've seen that happening, and, and we want to continue to encourage that. So, yeah, that's, again, one of the key outcomes we want to see from the ITP. I know that you have been involved in the field lay, uh, field, lay, field days innovation uh, yeah. as a judge. Yeah. We were going mm. to hopefully speak to one of the judges on Monday as well because mm. obviously the winners aren't out till tomorrow. Mm. Um, could you give us at least a little bit of an insight into how exciting some of the entrants were this yeah, year? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was just involved in the in the Partnership and Collaboration Award. And it's a tough award because, yeah, there's really, really cool um, things happening in that era. We're seeing, you know, I've been going to field days for at least 10 years. You know, initially in the private sector when I worked for a company like Livestock Improvement Corporation and more recently, you know, under a Callahan Innovation hat. And there's no question that over the years we're seeing more and more collaboration, you know, less of that DIY, you know, I've got to do everything myself or in-house. Um, and, you know, companies and organisations need to do that to be successful. You cannot possibly hold uh, all the knowledge and the technology in-house. I mean, you just have to partner with people to, to deliver products and services these days. So, yeah, I mean, um, we, we saw everything from biologics companies, you know, quite so complicated biological solutions to, to data, to engineering solutions, you know, you name it. The, the, the range is, is awesome. Really good. And of course, a lot of interest from those viewers online from around the world and potential investors. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, we've, um, it's something we've really been trying to encourage um, is is that international partnership piece. And again, that's, that's a key part of the, the industry transformation plan. So Field Days has had a really good relationship with Enterprise Ireland hmm. and uh, Innovate UK, for example. And we've you know reciprocated that by, by going over to Irish Plough and UK Dairy Day. Um, we're building relationships with Israel, actually. You mentioned them. 
So yeah, absolutely, because again, you know, expect us to do it all ourselves, um, and and have that sort of traditional trade mentality doesn't work in this area. You need to to build those um, partnerships. Um, we do have a live show with uh, questions that come in here. It's just a comment here from from one of our viewers that uh, yep. has, is heavily involved in the British High Commission's online contribution in field days, um, mm-hmm. saying that it was a significant number of UK participants that are very interested in agri-tech in New Zealand, um, and he was a panel member, um, a part of that online workshop at field days. So that's very encouraging to, to know. So... Um, uh, and then, to, of course, one of the questions that we're asking, just to end yeah. on, Simon, is yeah. um, you know one of your favourite things about field days, and you can't say the innovation yeah. section. You know, yeah. your, your prized purchase over the last ten years. <laughs> you know, I've never bought one, but I've always loved the bullwhip guys. You know, they, they've always got that same stand. They seem every year to have it, and they've always got someone demonstrating it, sort of almost endlessly, right? You know, they must have to tag team out. And I'm sure the, the half a dozen people they've got have got massive right arms from doing it. Because, yeah. you know, it's so like, you know, um, I've obviously got quite a lot of bit of interaction with the agricultural uh, sector. But, you know, I live in a, in, in a big city and, and, you know, just to see that kind of side of it, it's just, it's just awesome. So, yeah, I always look out for that, go for a walk and go see if they're still doing it every year. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Simon Yarrow from Callaghan Innovation, joining us there to celebrate the government's uh, investment and in funding into growing our agri-tech sector to hopefully $1.5 billion. And uh, I feel like we've come a long way in the last 10 years um, since Simon's been attending field days. What do you love about field days? Either the traditional one every year or did you get amongst the online virtual field days? Uh, of course, it ends tomorrow with with those famous innovation awards and we'll be talking about that on Serious Country on Monday. Hopefully we can get a winner on. That would be quite nice actually. Now coming up after the break, one of my dear friends who has been very innovative in establishing her own business in Southland, Tammy Wright from Fork and Spade joins us to talk about her riparian planting and landscaping business where her and her team are helping farmers with that challenge we heard from John Hickman last night. It's all well and good to bowl the plants but who's going to help us plant them and Tammy's going to give us some great tips on the right natives to select to make sure that you do it once and do it right coming up next on Sarah's Country this is Sarah's Country we're a large deer farm and very proud deer farmer at that I grew up here as a little boy it is just a, an amazing lifestyle. I, I could never live in a city ever again. Just the big open spaces and just the peacefulness of it all. I think deer are very majestic, very intelligent animal. Having deer that are under pressure or anything like that or overstocked, you know, they really don't perform as well. You should really be spreading them out on beautiful pastures. Keeping them happy, a happy deer is a, is a good deer. And good feed, you know, good grass. We renew our pastures all the time in the paddock, so we're always getting the best quality grass. Well, I guess in the wild, though, they don't have the luxury of the grass that we put in front of them here as a farmed animal. I believe that we've got some of the best English type deer in the country, if not the world to associate our brand with Silver Fern Farms brand is, uh, works for us. Without the likes of Silver Fern Farms, then there's no point doing this. So they're very, very important for us. I'm uh, Mark Tapley, very proud suppliers, venison to Silver Fern Farms.
As we heard earlier in Sarah's country from Aslan Wrightstow from Dairy NZ, there's new analysis out that provides farmers with greater certainty about how wetlands can improve water quality alongside the biodiversity benefits that they can provide. A well-designed farm wetland can remove 25 to 50% of nitrates in warm areas of New Zealand and 20 to 40% in those cooler areas. Now, I wanted to take a time to sort of get a bit more grassroots as we've been talking uh, around the theme of riparian and wetland planting throughout Sarah's country this week. Uh, And understand what challenges are facing a Southland riparian planting and landscaping business. Uh, So we're joined now by Tammy Wright from Fork and Spade. Thank you for taking the time to join us on Serious Country, Tammy. How is that weather in Southland at the moment? Um, it was a wee bit white this morning, but we've started to do frost this afternoon, so it's a bit warmer now. Oh, challenging conditions, especially in winter. Is that a good time for planting at the moment down there? Yes, yeah. The ground will start to thaw out in the next sort of six weeks, so if we can get stuff in um, any time now for the next month is really good, and then from there on is great. We're just putting in a lot hardier stuff at the moment and then we'll shift into natives when it does start to thaw. So give us some background. How? What was your journey to getting to the point of establishing a landscape and riparian and planting business to support farmers? Um, so I grew up in Glenorchy um, in quite a rural small community. Um, my dad and his partner had a contracting business up there and part of their contracting business was planting and landscaping. Um, we moved down to Mossburn with my partner and we've been down here about a year and a half. Um, I was employed for a short time down in Mossburn and then decided to start something of my own. So with a little bit of um, horticulture background and previous jobs throughout the walk tip, um, yeah, decided to go out on my own, which has been really exciting. You would have seen a real surge in demand for this type of extensive planting uh, over somebody's backyard. Yeah, yeah, it's just growing and we've just had positive feedback from clients and just people on the same sort of journey as us and it's really cool it's really um encouraging and it's great just we're just constantly learning and it's just yeah it's evolving quite it's quite quick but it's it's really exciting yeah I do want to talk about some of those challenges that we have addressed in previous interviews let's start with getting um labor and staff how are you finding it I think um, this will be our second spring um, coming in. So last year, I think we planted about five farms. I was really lucky last year with the employment that we had. Um, A lot of friends and we got a few casual staff, which was really good. Um, With it being so seasonal, it is hard to offer that 12 month or full time contract to people, which maybe isn't as, um, you know, inviting to come and sign. But um, yeah, having friends and really good I've um yeah got a really good team out of Winton as well so it is tricky but I think just providing that really good work workplace um is what I'm trying to do so hopefully they stick around Mm. so and also terms of getting your hands on the actual plants themselves since they're in such high demand how are you finding it in sourcing product yeah we've got a few really good main suppliers um they've been able to keep up 90 percent of our orders so far um you know, I keep checking in and just saying, you know, like we're getting busier. You guys are going to be getting busier. But I think I think I'm really hoping that they can keep up with the demand. And there is talk of more nurseries starting as well, which is really exciting. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the different natives and the different roles that they play and what you've learned around, you know, planting out wetlands versus, say, flowing streams. Yeah, so we we do the flowing streams as well as the wetlands, obviously. Um, we've just got a Um, We've got really good mix. We've got a lot of grey shrub that goes in. Um, I'm really conscious as well about not pushing fences over in five years' time and doing the job once and doing it right. So a lot of um, your carex grasses and stuff that are close to the water but not close enough to choke the water, they can sort of sit under there for a week or something without dying. Um, And it's just every... Absolutely every job we've done has been totally different. So you, it's really pays to get out on site first before you do select species that are going in there. So um, just a huge mix. And it's been really cool. Um, you know, you can kind of get your own flair and make it look really, really good as well as being functional. So, yeah. How much input from the farmers? You must have a real mix. Some say, 
you know, do what you want, just make sure it, it complies with my farm environment plan. But others would really feel a connection to the creativity in terms of varieties and what sort of a bird life and, and biodiversity they wanted to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. And it is really exciting when they want to jump on board and they've got a bit of fire in their belly about it as well. Um, it's, you know, you put the same effort in for everyone, but it is really cool when you can be on the same page and, and have a really good, exciting chat about what they're going to put in, like you say, with the birds or um, if they're, you know, if their top priority is with bees um, and stuff like that as well. So it is really exciting. What about when we're talking about plant selection? Um, you know, you've got certain things that can help filter nitrates uh, as they flow down, but also too on steeper slopes prevent erosion. Um, some tips that you could give to farmers that might be watching uh, in terms of plant selection and those types of sort of yeah. areas. <laughs> yeah, so um, how I take it, and there's been different discussions on that, is whether it's the leaf and the foliage that's helping actually stop that or whether it's the root system. So we're trying to work on a mix as well. So actually not getting stuff that establishes really fast because once it does establish quick and it has established, the root systems aren't quite as active. So brown top grass is still working as a really good filtering system, but you don't get that beautification that you do from natives as well and all the other benefits. So actually slow growing stuff um, can be really, really good. And then obviously um, if if you do have that erosion happening along creek sides or on hills, um, some deeper, some deeper, more established rooting stuff um, is really beneficial there. Yeah. So are you seeing a, a sort of a real energy around the growth of, as this current government would like to say, green jobs? Um, we have heard talk of it and there's been a few clients suggesting that they may be able to supply their own labour going forward with the help from there. Um, and I've heard no more than that. So I guess it's just wait and see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of uh, the amount of funding going into this particular area, you're pretty confident that you've got a good successful business for a long time. Yeah, we really hope so. And it's just doing the job right and doing it once and, you know, not... Um, yeah, not going out there and, and overspending and overplanting areas and stuff, just doing it really well and doing a really good job. It's what we're hoping for. So, um, yeah, I guess it's, yeah, just wait and see what happens with the labour and if it, um, if it comes through or, yeah. And fork and spade franchising around the country because you'll be in hot demand. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially some moves and um, getting a little bit further north. So, yeah, we're just kind of um, see where we're at first and then and then maybe look into something like that, which is pretty exciting. Awesome. So great, as always, to catch up. Tammy Wright, uh, the owner of Fork and Spade, a landscaping and riparian planting company based out of Mosbin in Southland. Uh, and, of course, grassroots on the ground, getting the job done. So proud of that beautiful young lady. Now, coming up to close in Sarah's country, we're going to be joined by Dr. John Roach. He is the chief scientist for uh, the Ministry for Primary Industries. And we're going to talk about how he feels the Embovis eradication has been tracking. Now it's nearly, well, it is ticked over three years since the decision to eradicate. All that to close in Sarah's country. This is Sarah's country. Growing a better world takes courage. It takes foresight and vision. It's about dreaming big, then being brave enough to follow that dream through. To create a world where food is plentiful, soils are healthy and rivers run crystal clear. A world where we grow more with less, where livestock is tended to with care. Energy is friend, not foe, and waste is a valuable resource. This is the world you're already shaping through imagination, innovation, and determination. So as small steps become huge leaps, you move boldly forward. And Rabobank is there beside you to help grow a better world together.
Well, New Zealand's world first effort to eradicate the cattle disease Mycoplasma bovis has made significant progress with the number of infected properties dropping to new lows. And this is three years to the day uh, since it was first uh, detected in New Zealand this week. 250 properties have been infected by the disease and joining us now to discuss uh, his thoughts on the progress is Dr John Roach from MPI. Welcome to the programme and thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, John? Uh, Kia ora Sarah, thank you for uh, allowing me on again. I didn't obviously didn't do too badly the last time if you've left me back. You're very, very popular last time. And unfortunately, we can't take any <laughs> questions from our audience, but we'll have to get you back on that as we continue to follow this closely and other things. Hey, so, I mean, under a lot of criticism, we are getting to new lows. How low do we go and how far away are we from that, that ultimate eradication? Well, ultimate eradication, obviously, we want to get down to zero and we have to be zero for quite some time before we can declare that we're we're free of the disease. So, um, and, and there's still some, quite some time. So not meaning to pour cold water on these announcements. It's, it's fantastic. We're down to four confirmed infected properties, you know, compared with 25 last year. We've got less than 50 under a notice of direction compared with almost uh, 240 this time last year, you know. So extraordinary differences um, in, in in numbers, uh, um, our estimated dissemination rate, which we talked about last time I was on, which is a, a measure of the number of infected farms during this quarter relative to the quarter beforehand, again, is substantially below one and has remained below that. Um, uh, so all of the indications are really, really good that we're making progress towards the to ending the delimitation phase, so the, del the delimiting phase. Sorry. Um, now we're still, you know, we're still somewhere between six and twelve months away from being sure of that. And and delimiting is is actually, you know, finding the cases that we know about, that that we can find easily. Um, then the the long harder work begins, which is, you know, you've got very low prevalence in the community, um, and and we're looking to find those last ones. Um, because and why I say that's hard is it's it's harder to find them, and because of our our farming systems and the way we move cattle around uh, relative to other countries, there's there's a real risk um, that if we don't find those herds that are still remaining quickly, that they will infect other other farms and we'll we'll still be inside in that in that tracing uh, situation. So there's still a lot of of hard work to be done, but the news is certainly very positive that we are where we are. What type of uh, influence does the particular seasons that are approaching us, such as calving and the transportation of calves to be reared, bring about fear in um, transmission? Yeah, look, they, they do. Um, so there's a couple of things there. So um, we, we still expect to find um, more infected herds as we bulk milk test through the spring. Um, that's where the bacteria tends to shed to, at the greatest level because uh, animals are under stress, obviously, through that calving period. Their immune system becomes uh, a little bit less effective than it is during established lactation. So diseases can take hold. And, and farmers will tell you that. That's where they see the vast majority of infectious disease, be, be it mastitis, metritis. Um, and even you know the metabolic diseases that we deal with at this time of the year, we we it also puts additional stress on the animals. So we expect to find more through that. Uh, certainly, the movement of calves between properties is 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 a great way of moving the disease um, if it's present on those properties. So again, all we can do is is really appeal to to all of all farmers on on both sides of that receiving and and trans and. and um, passing on route of calves that Nate is up to date, that we we know where these animals are coming from, we know where they're going and when it happened, and that allows us uh, to limit any potential spread. Mm. So with three years on, what do you believe three years on would have looked like if we didn't make the decision to eradicate? Oh, it's really it's really hard to say. Um, look, as you know, I dealt with Mycoplasma bovis on on grazing farms in the United States during a previous life, and outbreaks were incredibly traumatic. Um, traumatic for us as as farm owners, and and traumatic for the people working on the farm. You know where. Um, we were literally seeing uh, an incurable mastitis run through the lactating herd, and of course, feeding that to calves uh, and newborn animals with a with a poorly developed immune system. Um, uh, we were seeing big, healthy calves. Um, 
almost die overnight for when when you wouldn't expect them to. Uh, we certainly wouldn't expect them to from our history of farming in in New Zealand. Um, and so those those types of outbreaks would be traumatic on the farms that have to go through them. Um, and there would be an increased number of them because obviously you saw how many we had 250 farms that have been infected, and that was us working hard to stop the disease. How many would have been infected if we hadn't gone into an eradication program is probably anybody's guess, but it would have been considerable considering the amount of movement of stock, the mixing of young stock on, proper, on rearing properties, the mixing of dry stock in, in, in commercial um, you know, dry operations, etc. Um, I, I couldn't put a figure on it for you, but it wouldn't be a pleasant picture. And uh, lastly, from a biosecurity perspective, of course, with else add on top COVID-19 from a human transmission, do you believe that you've seen a real attitude change to on farm and for any future diseases? I suppose that's the, the big confidence that we'd all like as an industry that we're ready for the next thing. Oh, look, I, I think we have, um, and and hats hats off the farmer. I know Minister O'Connor said this in some of his communications over the last couple of days. This is this isn't an easy thing to do. We've we've got incredibly busy people doing uh, uh, you know long hours at, at key times of the year, dealing juggling a huge number of balls, and and we've we've thrown another ball into the mix here. Um, our net compliance has increased uh, significantly over the period of three years. Farmers. And, and and government, we've we've all understood the value of NEAT to a greater degree than we than we might have done um, at the start of this. Um, so we are seeing better practices. But I, again, I, I would encourage farmers to work with their industry bodies, with Dairy NZ and Beef and Lamb. They've got great resources around good biosecurity practices um, and, and you know how how they interact with visitors coming onto their properties. All those types of things. These are these are basic bread and butter of stock stopping disease spreading onto your property. We will do our best at the border, but you've got a border around your property as well and and that's that's your your kingdom. You know, let let's protect it. Let's let's wrap a moat around it and make sure that the enemy doesn't get in. Mm, thank you so much Dr. John Roach, uh, chief chief scientist at Ministry for Primary Industries. And of course the news is it's uh, this week passes 3 years since the decision to eradicate Embovis. I'd love to know your thoughts around the Embovis eradication in the comments below or feel free to email me at any time as well, uh, sarah at periamedia.com. There is a new article out on farmersweekly.co.nz today following through on the Embovis story. Uh, and Frank Peters has said losing his 1,400 cow herd to Embovis nearly killed him, but he is happy to hear that three years later there's confidence that eradication of the disease is on track and his heartache hasn't been in vain. And of course, that is uh, all we have time for tonight. Uh, and I am just going to take the time to read some of these comments. Tammy Wright has got some fantastic viewers that are. Sarah Price has said, you're my idol, Tammy. Ellie Steele, what a legend. And Becky Ryan uh, Kilmick, you're a legend, Tammy Wright. She absolutely is a, an absolute legend. Uh, as well as all of our guests on Sarah's Country and all the hard work that they do across our food and fibre sector. Thank you so much for being a fantastic audience tonight. Uh, we've been talking about field days and what you enjoy. Uh, Michael said that he thoroughly enjoys white bait fritters. Um, if I wasn't sort of uh, gorging on them from my father's stockpile, I might not be so sharp this season. Actually, the boy's about to be ready to put the, the white bait stand up end of August. Um, but yes, it is a great ch chance to get some white bait if you don't get a privilege to have some throughout the year. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Field Days has been online and virtual and, and you have, and from the comments are telling me that you really did enjoy um, the online virtual. But of course, I know but physically it will be welcomed back. Of course, we've got some great events coming up soon. The Ag Fest, Farmlands Ag Fest on the West Coast, who's coming? I'm certainly looking forward to heading over to the West Coast. The best hospitality, some of the best hospitality in this country and some hard yakka characters as well. Uh, and of course, you know, we'll have the field days at Kiwi. 
uh, at the start of next year as well, coming up soon. And that's always a fantastic event as well. I uh, hope you all have a wonderful weekend around the country. We'll be back on Monday night from 7 o'clock. And as we said at the start of the show, uh, we're cutting back Monday to Wednesday as we reformat a bigger and better show for you uh, as we kick off into the spring. If you, as I said, any email me, Sarah at perimedia.com and of course uh, any of the full link stories at farmersweekly.co.nz. We'll do this all again. Have a safe and wonderful weekend wherever you are around the country uh, and we'll see you again Monday night at 7 o'clock. Good night. Go well. This is Sarah's Country.